everybody. We <laughs> so we're going to get started. Um, so welcome everyone to the book launch of Still Living the Edges, a disabled woman's reader. My name is Janelle Shaw, and I'm the executive director of Arts Accessibility Network Manitoba. Uh, I would like to begin with a land acknowledgement. Winnipeg is located on Treaty One territory, the traditional ter <laughs> sorry, <laughs> the traditional territory of the Nishinaabe, Cree, Oji Cree, Dakota, and Dene's people, and the homeland of the Métis Nation. We respect the treaties that were made on these territories. We acknowledge the harms and mistakes of the past, and we dedicate ourselves to move forward in partnership with Indigenous communities in a spirit of reconciliation and collaboration. Uh, we would also like to acknowledge that all water here in Winnipeg is sourced from Shower Lake 40 First Nation. Uh, I would like to quickly go over some housekeeping for this event. We ask that those on Zoom mute themselves and keep their cameras off. Uh, the speakers will be invited to unmute and turn their cameras on when it's their turn to speak. Uh, for those in person, we have refreshments on the side. Feel free to grab those at any time. If you would like to purchase a copy of the book, you can do so in person after the presentation at the table in the back. And uh, we can also, you can also purchase it online at inana.ca, and I'll put the link in the chat in a minute. Uh, today we have ASL interpretation as well as live captioning. So, thank you everyone for attending this event. Arts Accessibility Network Manitoba is proud to partner with Inanna Publications to present Still Living the Edges, a disabled woman's reader. Uh, Arts Accessibility Network Manitoba, or AANM, is a regional artist-run nonprofit organization dedicated to the full inclusion of artists and audiences with disabilities into all facets of the art community. Our mandate is to facilitate a network of artists and stakeholders from both the arts and disability communities um, that support artists with disabilities in achieving individual, in individual artistic excellence, promotes higher visibility of these artists within all disciplines, and promotes policies and practices intended to make the arts more accessible to all Manitobans. In Anna Publications, uh, editorial policy is to publish visionary books that reflect the depth, breadth, and diversity of women's lives across Canada and around the world. Their priorities are to publish literary books, in particular by fresh, new Canadian voices that are intellectually rigorous, speak to women's hearts, and tell truths about the lives of the broad diversity of women. Smart books for people who want to read and think about real women's lives. Brenda Craney, the president of Anana Publications, was unable to attend today, but she sent me a note to read on her behalf. Hello and welcome. My name is Brenda Craney. I am writing on behalf of Anana Publications. Regrettably, I am unable to attend the launch tonight, but I would like to thank Arts Accessibility Network Manitoba and the Canadian Museum for Human Rights for hosting this wonderful event. I also wanted to send a few words of support and celebration of Diane Dreger's new book, Still Living the Edges, a disabled woman's reader. A huge thank you to the talented co contributors sharing their work with you tonight. In my primary role as president of Inanna Board of Directors, I was familiar with Diane's first edited book, Living the Edges, published in two th with us in 2010. 11 years ago, Diane's anthology was a groundbreaking collection bringing together the diverse voices of Canadian women with a variety of disabilities and confronting challenges and barriers, forcing them to the edges of society. That book filled a void in the literature at the time. It continues to reach new audiences and is consistently used as course material in colleges and university classrooms across the country. This new follow-up collection, Still Living the Edges, builds on that impressive work and has even expanded its reach to include international contributors from Canada, the United States, Australia, Russia, the United Kingdom, and Zimbabwe. Like Diane's first book, this edition straddles several genres and includes articles, poetry, essays, and visual art. And it places women, women themselves at the center of new and emerging narratives about disabilities. 
We are so thrilled and proud to have published this important book. Thank you, Diane, and thank you to the book's many contributing authors. Your work will undoubtedly inspire a new generation of women to continue to challenge the edges. All the best and enjoy the special evening. Thank you, Brenda, for your, those words of support. Tonight, we will hear from 10 contributors. Is it 10 or 11? 10, <laughs> sorry. From 10 contributors who are joining us both in person and virtually. They will be speaking about their experiences as deaf and or disabled women in an ableist world. To begin, I would like to introduce the editor of Still Living the Edges, Diane Dreger. Diane Dreger has been involved in the disability rights movement at the local, national, and international levels for 40 years with organizations such as Disabled Women's Network Canada and Disabled Peoples International. She has published 11 books, including five anthologies by women with disabilities. She is also a poet and a visual artist. Diane is the assistant professor in the Inter Interdisciplinary Master's Program in Disability Studies at the University of Manitoba. Thank you, Diane. Great to see you all out on this spring evening. I think the snowmageddon is finally over. We shall see. Uh, hopefully the sun will be out and eat up all that snow in the next few days. I'm so pleased to be here and have this book launch. I was thinking that it might not be possible to have it in person because of COVID and it's so good to see some of my fellow authors here and online and for us to be together to celebrate the voices of women with disabilities. This book has the voices of 40 women, 4-0. The voices, the artwork, uh, poetry, uh, and they are from around the world, as was mentioned, across Canada, and women with various disabilities, both mental and physical. And, um, Everybody is going to read a little bit from their book tonight, the book tonight, uh, uh, or synops give a synopsis of what they have done. I just want to say that uh, the reason why I do these books is because I know how important it is for women's voices to be heard, and often women with disabilities are not heard from in our society. Uh, they are, they're living on the edges, right? This is why the name of the book is Still Living the Edges, because 11 years ago I had a book called Living the Edges, and we know what? We're still living the edges. So uh, not much has changed in terms of attitudes in particular towards uh, women with disabilities, but one thing that has changed is that we have many more voices in this book than the first one women with uh, disabilities that have not been represented before, and I'm so happy that uh, they are included here. So I myself also have a chapter in this book, and it's called Invalids at Work. Charles Darwin, Florence Nightingale, and me. And if you look at this uh, article, it's a, it's a manual about how to work like Florence and Charles. Did you know that Florence and Charles had chronic illnesses for most of their lives? Charles uh, had it for 40 years. Remember, he went to those Galapagos Islands, right? And uh, did that research on the origin of the species. While he was there, he got some kind of fever that he never recovered from. And therefore, he needed to work at home. He often needed to rest uh, lying on the couch during the day. He needed to make sure he got fresh air every day. He worked a very precise amount of hours, maybe two or three hours, very intensely. And then that was it for him. He was done for the day. He had a lot of issues with fatigue. And he needed to have a bathroom nearby. Let's just put it that way. This, this fever continued to affect him. And in fact, he even uh, wouldn't go to scientific conferences. Once his book came out on the origin of the, of the species, uh, particularly the Christians, Christians were attacking him because he was saying that evolution was real. And he did not go out to conferences to defend his work. He sent his colleagues, he asked them to go on his behalf 
because what? It was not accessible at those locations. There were no washrooms that he would be able to use, and he could not go, uh, you know, and attend a conference if there wasn't a washroom nearby. Also, um, he often found the stress of just appearing in public was very fatiguing as well. Now, Florence. Florence Nightingale founded the modern uh, nursing profession uh, and she founded it from her bed and her couch in her house in London. She, um, she got a fever at, at the, 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 in the Crimean War where she started nursing when she was a young woman and she never got over that fever either. And so she had fatigue and pain and she needed to rest a lot. She didn't go out a lot. She, she organized the School of Nursing in London, you know, by letter and by having people visit her at her bedside. So the point here is I have tips from Florence and, and Charles about how to work with chronic illness and to be successful. And of course, they both wrote a lot of books a lot of articles and they are people that we know I have made a huge contribution. They're people with disabilities. And so I also talk then about how Charles and Florence have influenced me in my journey with working with chronic illnesses too. And a lot of, uh, frankly, a lot of the stuff they do is stuff I do. And Charles really has inspired me along with Frida Kahlo, the Mexican artist uh, who was uh, um, a disabled woman who used to do a lot of her work lying down and there is a, a portrait of Frida Kahlo by Charlene Detoit in the book. Um, a lot of women with disabilities, uh, you know, uh, identify with her because she is, uh, well, she's a groundbreaking artist. She had disability. She worked from her bed as well. So we're, I'm questioning notions around work. Do we need to sit in a chair from nine to five uh, to be working? Obviously not. So there are many tight ways to work, many ways to contribute and get things done. So you can read more about that. Um, but first of all, I'd just like to read a short poem that is also in the book. It's called Invalid, because you know, Charles and Florence were classified as invalids in Victorian England. There was a role for you. you. You were sick, so you stayed home, right? We don't really have that role anymore. But I started thinking about that word invalid. I'm an invalid, right? You're someone who stays a lot in bed. You rest a lot here. Invalid. Invalidation. Increase intrepid, invite into my world. So now I would like to introduce uh, Jessie Turner, and she is going to talk about her art piece, Untitled Mermaid. Jess. Thanks, Diane. Can you hear me well enough? Can I hear? So I, Diane's been a mentor of mine for quite a few years, over a decade now, I would say. So I was very um, humbled and, and want not to be asked to contribute to the book. And so this is a piece of art that I made during a mentorship project between the Arts Accessibility Network of Manitoba and Martha Street Studio. And it's a print of a mermaid with, so she's sitting on a rock with her back turned to the viewer. Her hair is blowing in the wind and her tail is wrapped around the rock that's protruding from the sea. So during my mentorship at Arts Accessibility Network in Martha Street Studio, um, there was a group of women with disabilities uh, that all participated, and it was a really amazing experience to be a collective of women uh, working in a studio, um, questioning and 
pondering questions of what it means to be a woman with a disability, an artist with a disability, what is art, what is disabled art. We also uh, worked very closely with the studio itself to make the spaces accessible, accessible for everyone. So again, it was a very collaborative and amazing experience. And the reason why I chose the image of a mermaid is it's an image that a lot of disa physically disabled women relate to in that our bodies don't necessarily look or work the way um, society expects our bodies to. And so during my art practice, my research, all through the different stages of my own disability, I've always considered what does it mean to have a disability? What impact does disability have on my identity? Is it possible to have a healthy identity as a woman with a disability? And what does it mean to have disability pride? And so I try to portray those ideas and notions through my work. Thanks. Great. Thanks, Jess. I'd now like to call upon Annika Dreger, who is going to um, talk about her piece, The Dyslexic Diary. Hi, everyone. So like Diane said, uh, my name is Annika Dreger, and my piece in the book is called The Dyslexic Diary. So for most of my schooling, I've had an official diagnosis of dyslexia. For me, this diagnosis assured me that I wasn't dumb and has opened several doors for me as I've navigated my way through elementary and high school. When I first started writing my contribution to this book, I was 14 in the ninth grade. I was fresh into the new challenge of high school. Currently, I am 18 and in my last semester of high school. Although I've grown and changed over the four years since I wrote my piece, my diagnosis story and the feelings that I wrote about have not changed. Throughout my time speaking, I'm going to uh, flip through reading excerpts from what I wrote, as well as uh, personal stories and elaborating on them. So here is uh, my diagnosis story from the book. In the first grade, my parents started to notice that my reading wasn't progressing. It was way below the expected reading level for my year. They had gone to my teacher many times concerned about my reading, but they were told that this was normal. They were told that many kids struggled with reversal of letters and mixing up numbers. During the summer going into grade two, my mom and I worked on my reading all summer. When I entered grade two and I was tested to see where my reading level was, nothing had changed. My parents again asked if it was normal for me not to be progressing. My teacher said it was normal. My parents didn't stop searching for answers. It wasn't just the fact that I couldn't read at the level I was supposed to be reading at. When reading simple rhyming books, I couldn't pick up on the pattern and couldn't rhyme at all. Along with not being able to rhyme, I struggle to recognize the difference between uppercase and lowercase letters. I read words by the shape. I take each word's outline and memorize it. If you were to give me a word, I could tell you that it was spelt wrong because the shape was wrong, but I could have no idea how to put it back in the correct order. When reading a book with my mom one night, I got to the word good with a lowercase g, and I read the word fine. When we turned the page, there was uh, the word good with a capital G at the beginning of a sentence. I was unable to recognize this word. She was confused why I couldn't read it. I had just read it on the page before. I told her I'd never seen that word before. Because the G was capitalized, it had changed the complete shape of the word and I was unable to read it. My mom was prompted by a family friend to look into, into dyslexia as a cause for my difficulties in learning. She Googled the symptoms and I was a perfect match. I was then tested and did in fact have dyslexia. As I said before, this diagnosis opened many doors, but at the beginning it didn't feel like that. When my parents brought the diagnosis to my teacher in grade two, she refused to recognize it. She told them that dyslexia did not exist. She refused to give me the accommodations necessary for me to succeed in her classroom. This eventually led to me having to switch schools and getting the accommodations I needed to succeed. Living with dyslexia has taught me to advocate for myself and make sure I get the accommodations that I need. I've been accommodating, I've been advocating for myself all the way through high school without my mom beside me. 
And each time I walk up to a teacher to tell them, I still get that anxious feeling that they might tell me it doesn't exist or they might tell me that they can't accommodate me, just like I was told when I was younger. People often assume that dyslexia only affects someone's reading and writing abilities. Dyslexia, which is a language processing disorder, affects so much more than that. Everything in this world, whether it's given to me written or by the oral, or by, or, by orally, requires me to process the language, something I'm not very good at doing, which is, my, which is why my dyslexia doesn't just affect me in the classroom, but in every area of my life. I've been playing sports since I was a kid and have played several varsity sports throughout my time in high school. Although physically I can play the, the sport, when things get like they're in the classroom and they start drawing drills on the whiteboard is when I struggle. If a coach were to draw out a drill in this corner of the ice on this circle and then tell us to go do it on this corner of the ice in this circle, I can't do it. I can't flip the drill. So it just takes time for the coach to slow down, make sure that they're explaining it correctly and just having that open conversation for myself and advocating for myself so that I can su succeed on the ice or the court. The name of my chapter, which is the Dyslexic Diary, has a lot of meaning behind it. When I was first diagnosed, my mom thought it would be a good idea for me to write down what I was feeling and what I was struggling with. We called this my Dyslexic Diary. The idea for my website, however, was originally sparked by a project given to me in grade seven. The project was simple. My teacher told us to change the world. Sounds simple enough, right? I decided to start a website called The Dyslexic Diary. A lot of kids not, ended up not completing the project, but I was determined to do something. So after thinking about it for a long time, I started a website to raise awareness for dyslexia. This would be a place where kids could go to hear real life stories about other kids like them. I wanted to create a platform where kids could learn about dyslexia without the stress of having to read long articles. That was how the idea of doing video interviews was formed. When I was nine years old, we even filmed a video of me talking about my dyslexia, which proved to be very useful in the long run, and we've used the video on my website. KC Dyslexic Learning Center, which is where I was tested, diagnosed, and then tutored in the Barton program, and through my connections with them, I was able to find kids that were willing to be interviewed and talk about how they found out they were dyslexic and the struggles they faced. These interviews, although they focused on dyslexia, I wanted to get a sense of who they were and any interests outside of just their struggles in dyslexia, such as sports or lessons that they participated in. And many of the kids were very active outside of school and most played sports as well as instruments. High school for me has been a roadmap that's been extremely hard to navigate. Although I figured out what works for me and succeeded and made it to the end, well, almost the end. Although my chapter in the book comes to an end, my story doesn't. This fall, I will take on the challenge of university, where I will study global issues at the University of British Columbia. This new adventure will bring many more challenges for me to overcome, but throughout it all, I will continue to advocate for myself and others with dyslexia to make sure educators are informed so that no one and no kid has to sit at their desk again as the whole class moves on without them, making them feel alone and stupid, as I once did. Thank you, Annika. Folks may be wondering, is Annika related to me? Yes, she is my niece. I'm so proud of her. Uh, I would next like to introduce Joanna Hawkins, and she is going to talk about her piece, Deaf Out Loud, and she joins us online. Joanna? Thank you, thank you so much. <clears throat> yes, my name is Joanna Hawkins. I am deaf. So I'm going to be signing a bit uh, from my chapter and plus add a little bit to what I'd like to say as well. I always felt um, very connected and I had no fear as a young person um, being a deaf person. My only friend that I had was a German Shepherd growing up and my cat, because those two, you know, paid attention to me. And I would see my family 
you know, gather at different celebrations and they'd all be laughing around the table and eating and just really enjoying everyone's company. And I always thought, I wish I could understand what they were saying. I wish they would tell me what was going on, but they never did. They would just make short comments like going, oh, oh, your aunt is talking about her trip to Egypt. That's all. <clears throat> and, you know, as, and that's what, you know, people would say to me, uh, because they would just be hearing everything that's going around. Of course, it would be very difficult to, to tell me everything. And I would only get 80% of the incidental information. So at my family gatherings, there was no access for me to language. And so in, in the place of being at the kitchen table or dining room table, they would let me watch TV. And I would watch different shows like Mr. Bean or Charlie Chaplin because I could understand what they were doing. I could understand the acting. Mr. Bean, you know, he had a great influence on me in my acting um, career that I've had. They, you know, was just, it was a way that they got around being frustrated and that helped me alleviate some of my frustration too. I would really like to emphasize that you know, children um, who lose their hearing or born deaf or have a hearing loss of some type, um, you know, whether they have hearing aids, it doesn't matter, you know, what type of hearing loss they have. It's always important to welcome them into the conversation and make conversation accessible to them and not just at a superficial level. I'm not talking about just the general topics that people are you know, talking about. I know when I was growing up, they never told me, my family never gave me enough information. <clears throat> and, you know, having that, um, that, that ability to not access all that information and people not including me can lead to psychological and social hurts. Um, they could lead to low self-esteem and not you know, feeling that they belong. It doesn't matter if a person's deaf or hard of hearing, just check with them to see how they would like to be communicated with and what makes them feel included. And that could range from gesturing to hiring an interpreter, writing back on four, back uh, back and forth on pen and paper, doing a little bit of lip reading. You know, it's just important that they have access to information so they feel that they too belong. I know when I was watching Mr. Bean as a child, I started to realize, you know, I could understand what they were trying to communicate yet they had no language. They were not using words. It was all physical. It was all mime. And people who weren't deaf also could understand them. And same with Charlie Chaplin. Everybody understood what he was acting. Everybody understood what he was doing. There was no language involved with that. It was only the physicality of acting. And I want to encourage, you know, people who are not deaf, if they, you know, see someone who is deaf or they come across someone who is deaf, not to be afraid, not to be apprehensive, not to feel like, oh, I don't know how to communicate with them. You know, they want to communicate with you just as much. We are just starving for, you know, communication with everyone. And there's so many different ways to communicate with people. And you just have to figure out what that is. And that will like go a long way to making someone feel very included. You know, whether they be deaf or hard of hearing, some people are very apprehensive. Oh, you know, I don't know what to do. You know, they try their best and they might, you know, give one or two words and, you know, smile and nod. Um, and that is all very well intended, but it's just not enough. So the story that I was able to contribute, um, you know, I really feel that it's, um, worth letting people know that we are approachable and we want to be included. 
we don't have to wait until you know American Sign Language or, you know, you have a pen and paper. You don't have to wait. You just go and you try and you do what you can do with everyone to communicate. Um, it's an, a really um, exciting and uh, very emotional mo moment when someone tries to communicate with us. You know, all deaf people want, including myself, is to belong. That's all we want. We don't, we want to belong without barriers. There doesn't have to be barriers. There's enough barriers in the world alone. Um, it doesn't have to be with communication. So I'm hoping that the chapter that I was able to contribute will make people think and then will make that uh, feeling of being uncomfortable approaching someone who is deaf a little less uncomfortable. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Joanna. Our next reader is Samantha Rayburn Trubick. And she is uh, going to talk about her article, Life As I Know It. Hi, everyone. So I'm just going to read an excerpt from my book, uh, from my book, sorry, from Diane's book, uh, from my <laughs> chapter. Um, so my chapter is Life As I Know It. So navigating through life at four feet tall gives you a different perspective on the world, both literally and figuratively. In the figurative sense, my perspective is basically the same as everyone else's just, sorry, basically the same as everyone else's, just usually obscured. However, in the literal sense, my perspective may be a little different than someone who was born able-bodied. At birth, I was diagnosed with a type of dwarfism known as achondroplasia. On the day of my birth, the doctor who delivered me stood in an elevator with my father and told him what a shame it was that I would most likely be institutionalized and essentially amount to nothing in this world. On the first day of my life, I encountered institutional prejudice, which happens to be, which, sorry, was perhaps a bellwether for what I was going to have to deal with for the rest of my life. I should preface this essay declaring that I am very proud of who I am and very proud to be a little person, that if given the choice again in life, I would choose it over again. I would decline any offer to be able-bodied. That being said, there is no shortage of times in my life when my resolve to be content with who I am was tested. I've been called many names, and I've had many unique interactions with people, some who intended to hurt my feelings, and others who did so through ignorance. The names that I've been called are not worth repeating. However, there's one, Midget, which is the most prevalent and which has become the focus of my recent advocacy work. A common theme around some of the more bizarre interactions that I've had with people seem to focus on my stature as the result of malnutrition. I have been asked on several occasions whether or not my parents have fed me enough as a child, implying that if I don't eat properly as a youngster, you may develop late onset dwarfism. I'm still not sure when this idea started or why so many people think malnutrition is the cause of dwarfism. It's been my observation that when you're younger and in school, name calling and class and classifications are more hurtful than when you are older. The hurtfulness of those comments seems to be amplified by your inexperience, which limits your ability to deal with them effectively. To put it frankly, being in school and looking different than everyone else is not fun. As I've grown older, my coping skills have improved and I have achieved this by creating my own three-part classification system to help me rationalize and deal with insults and injustices that I'm faced with on a daily basis. The system works as follows. The first classification is the most common, and I would label it as simply ignorance. These are comments made by people who do not understand that some people are different. Maybe they've had no exposure to someone like myself, or simply have an inability to think before they speak. These types of comments are the easiest to identify, and are the easiest for me to disregard immediately. The second classification I would label as intentionally offensive. These comments, they belong in the classification, often sound the same as those from the ignorant pile. However, the context or tone in which they are uttered help identify them as being mean or mal malicious. 
and if they were intentionally designed to marginalize me and make me feel bad about who I am. These comments thankfully are rarer than the ignorant ones. They are also more difficult to digest. Throughout my advocacy work, as I began to poke and prod at things that have become culturally acceptable, I have found the intentionally offensive remarks begin to multiply in quantity. These types of comments are most found on social media platforms. The third classification is what I call institutional prejudice. These are not necessarily comments that are being made, but rather hurdles and obstacles that have been erected that make my life more difficult and serve as a constant reminder to me that I am disabled, that I'm a disabled person clearly living in an able-bodied world. The next time you go to put a quarter in a parking meter, take notice of how high the coin slot is from the ground, and then think of me. Institutionalized prejudice is often a faceless enemy of mine and can sometimes be the most frustrating to deal with. The idea of creating an internal classification system like this was born out of necessity. It took a great deal of life experience for me to come to the realization that I cannot go to war every time I hear an offensive comment or encounter a situation that is unjust. I would be spending all of my time dealing with these issues and would finish every day completely drained emotionally. By developing a way to classify the comments and injustices I encounter, I can conserve my emotional energy and save myself from frustration. It allows me the ability to decide when I should educate, dig in, confront, or when I should let it go and ignore. Ignorant comments can be a great opportunity to educate. Intentionally offensive comments sometimes need to be confronted and other times ignored. And institutional prejudices almost always require advocacy work. The only way that I can think to fight against institutional prejudice is through advocacy. When I set out for university and into my working career after that, I did not seek out advocacy as a, as a direction for my future. My goal was to find a, few, find a career that fulfilled me, start a family, and live in a nice, quiet, peaceful, happy life. I gave birth to my son in 2005, and like me, he was born with a chondroplasia. Although the experience that I had with the medical staff who delivered my son was not the same as my parents, um, it was also not very different. The day after my son was born, before I was discharged from the hospital, a doctor came to ask me some probing questions about how I was coping with my son who was born with dwarfism. Believe it or not, they even offered to uh, give me a th uh, prescribe me a therapist. And if I wish to discuss what life would be like with him. I'm sure the medical staff in this particular case were simply following protocols with this process, and I appreciate that there are services available to help people in various situations. However, I found this scenario underscored just how early in life people with disabilities are treated differently than people born able-bodied. At four years of age, I started attending an annual conference held by Little People of America. My parents, the ultimate advocates, recognized that there was a lack of extensive support in Manitoba and sought out this support network. They believed that the lifetime value of this yearly event to be immeasurable, and they were right. They prioritized this conference as part of our family trip uh, annually, and we've missed very few. The LPA, Little People of America, is a large advocacy organization that is made up of 13 districts which cover the continental United States. They host a week-long national conference once a year for members to network and to make lifelong friendships, relationships, and to help others navigate life in a similar fashion than I do. I started taking my son uh, to these conferences on before his second birthday and continued to take him every year. Creating this type of network was extremely valuable to me, and I can see how valuable it is for him. As an adolescent, I valued LPA for its fun conference and nothing more. As I grew older and wiser, I began to recognize and appreciate the value of the organization's advocacy work. Their work ranges from fighting social injustice to the prolification of improved and accurate medical practices for people born with skeletal dysplasia to ensuring mental health of its members are prioritized as such as much as physical health. And I was led to pursue advocacy in my spare time 
through my connection with this organization, as well as my son coming into an age where he would be attending school and beginning to deal with insensitive and offensive behaviors from others. I became president of Little People of Manitoba in 2015, and the mandate for the organization had strictly been to increase its membership and host events with members to promote network opportunities for little people living in this province, uh, but mostly for the kids in the organization who could make some friends who were just like them. That type of work is still being done and its value cannot be overstated. However, the Little People of Manitoba organization has now branched out to tackle some more controversial advocacy endeavors. And to learn more about those endeavors, please pick up the book <laughs> after this session. Thank you, Samantha. Our next uh, reader is Ruth Enns, and her piece is called Epidemic, and Ruth is joining us online. Hi. Thank you, Diane, Janelle, and Anna Publishing, Arts Accessibility, and all the people involved in putting this book together and for the opportunity to be part of it. I'm glad the book is being launched in this complex museum because to me, the building's disorienting interior reflects my disoriented efforts to untangle my life story from the prevailing narrative. This excerpt is part of one attempt to reach that glass spire where I can look around and find my place in the world. Epidemic. When one member of a family changes, all the other members must shift to accommodate the change. A tsunami-sized change such as an epidemic overturns everything, leaving the survivors to rebuild, find a new norm. I survived an epidemic, so did all of my siblings, even my youngest brother, born two years after polio swept southern Manitoba. Our parents were also survivors born of sturdy pioneer stock. I turned five that year, 1952, the year the Salk vaccine was first tested and long before Medicare. The three youngest of us exhibited symptoms. My three-year-old brother Ron and I were taken to the local hospital in Morris, 10 dusty potholed miles east of our home in Low Farm. After about three days, he went home while I was taken to the children's hospital in Winnipeg. Mom sitting with me in the back seat of Reverend George Greening's car. I don't know whether he knew the risk he was taking for himself and his family. It took courage and no doubt the strength of his convictions to chauffeur a child with a contagious disease that frightened many people away from public gatherings. Fortunately, he and his family experienced no ill effects. Dad stayed home in Low Farm to care for the other three children, milk the cows, feed the pigs, gather eggs, and tend the grain fields several miles away. My 10-year-old sister Vicky was in and out of the local hospital for two months with a fever. Both she and Ron recovered. Mel, the oldest of 13, remembers his fear of also getting sick, checking himself daily for symptoms. Polio divided my life, pre-polio with no memory and post-polio with memory, a few vague hospital memories dividing the two. The pre-polio period was a taboo topic at home, and maybe that's why that part of my life is a blank. As for the hospital, I remember the scalding hot compresses applied to my arms. They hurt. I favored the dark-haired nurse who handled me more gently than the others. In the long ward adjacent to my room lay people dependent on iron lungs or rocking beds. Fortunately for me, I never needed one of those machines, but fortunately for those who did, those ancestors of ventilators gave them breath and life. Vicky says hospital rules allowed our parents to see me only twice weekly. After the long ride to the city, she and my brothers stayed in the car, staring up at my window, trying to catch a glimpse of our parents. I was too sick to leave my bed. Mother told me later that on one such visit, they discovered I could no longer move my arms or hands, except for a tiny wiggle of my left forefinger. I couldn't play with the paper dolls she had brought me. 
She said nothing about the devastation they must have felt. My parents, especially my father, never recovered from my paralysis. A mere six years earlier, they had buried a daughter, Leona, who died because of her defective heart. They had rescued her from doctors who wanted them to abandon her. They took turns carrying her all day, every day, for her two years and three months on this earth. Now this, surely God was punishing them for something. When dad bought health insurance, had he not trusted God enough? Dad already carried a strong sense of guilt. He harbored the demons of an abusive father. Born in 1896, 18 years before mom, he had been raised in a conservative Mennonite home to pray to a harsh, punitive God. With that kind of role model and religion, it is easy to understand why he turned to controlling others and everything as a way to contain those demons. After two months in hospital, I went home, my arms suspended from my neck by two makeshift slings. The weight of my arms pulled my neck and back forward into a stoop. My father fretted at seeing me this way and begged my mother to devise something to lighten that load. A devout woman, mom prayed until an idea came to her. With the help of her sister Susan, she raided her old corsets for their bones and created a vest she called a harness. The bones formed arches over my shoulders. Slings attached to the shoulders transferred the weight of my arms from my neck to my waist. I wore different versions of that harness every waking hour until I reached puberty. Her ingenious invention kept my growing spine straight. Medical experts photographed it, but I don't know that it was ever copied. My type of paralysis was rare. However, sometimes helpful interventions can have unintended negative side effects, just like prescription drugs. Recently, I realized that the harness was not just a successful homemade orthotic device, it was also a straitjacket. From polio to puberty, it confined me, constricting my movement, simultaneously trumpeting my differences and inadequacies, marking me as different, the other. My role had changed. I was to be permanently dependent, cared for, never to experience the kind of adult life anticipated for other girls. And that's all, the rest is in the book. Thank you. Thank you, Ruth. I'm now going to call on Valerie Walbert and she is one of the co-authors of the article, The Freedom Tour Documentary, An Experiment in Inclusive Filmmaking. Valerie? Oh, could you unmute Val? We can't hear you. Yeah, I'm unmuted now. You're good. Go ahead. Okay, thank you. Making the Freedom Tour documentary is an experience we will never forget. The three of us, along with three other People First Winnipeg members, worked together for over two and a half years to create a documentary about what it's like to live inside and survive an institution for people la labeled with an intellectual disability. We recently celebrated the Freedom Tour's 10th year anniversary in Ottawa. It's hard to believe that 10 years have gone, but since we were on the road, since we originally wrote this chapter, a few of us have moved out of province to be closer to family. In 2018, we lost Susie, a strong advocate for the rights to live in the community and more importantly, our friend. We all met for the first time in February 2005 as a rally held at the Manitoba Legislature to protest our provincial government's decision to invest more money into the Manitoba Developmental Centre, an institution located on the outskirts of Portia Prairie, a small town an hour drive from Winnipeg. Over the last 100 years, MDC has had different names like Home for Incurables, Manitoba School for 
mental deficiency and Manitoba School for Mental Retardation. Parents were concerned to put their children in places like MDC. They were told their son or daughter would get an education and specific specialized health care nobody else could provide in the community. We know from survivors of institutions across Canada that this didn't happen. Instead, people suffered. They didn't get an education. And once they were placed in there, it was very hard to get out. For over a year, Valerie, Mark, Kevin, and later Susie met on a weekly basis at Dave's apartment to work on a film proposal. Sometimes we went on trips or visit people we thought we would like to include in our film. Jose would write things up based on what we talked about and we would read it out loud and tell her if it was okay or not. This is also the way we're writing the art, this article, Valerie Wolbert recounts. We watched a lot of movies. We talked about how we would connect with other groups across the prairies. We were all watching that documentary entitled, How's Your News? And Kevin and I were wondering if we could get an RV and, and some banners. I was making lots of lists and came up with the idea of the balloons. That couldn't have been me asked about, you think you could put some signs on the side of the RV? Plus I got some really good news to tell everybody. On January 29th, the government, the Manitoba government has declared that within the next three years, the in 1920, uh, 2021, the Manitoba Development Center will be closed within the next three years. And over the next three years, 133 people will be moving from the institution and into community living. All people have the right to live in the community. They belong in the community, not in an institution, says Corey Earl, president of People First to Canada. This is a big victory for human rights in our country. It is a big advantage in human rights for all people with intellectual disabilities. And I wanna thank everybody for coming today and being online as presenters. Thanks, Diane, for the great book that you have provided. And everybody, please come and buy Diane's book. Thank you, bye. Thanks, Valerie. Our next presenter is um, Nancy Hansen. And she has written a piece called, um, Am I Worth It? Nancy? Thanks very much. Oh, thanks very much, Diane. I guess I should turn my video screen on just one second. Okay, let's see here. The mind is willing, the hand has other ideas. So I think I will just go with my voice. So just pretend it's radio. Um, it, I'm, I'm really um, honored to be here tonight um, because all, um, amongst so many um, fine disabled people, and it's almost two years ago to the day that the landscape began to shift. Two years ago today, I was on my way back from Regina and the pandemic had just been declared. Overnight, things began to shift. Conferences shut down, restaurants closed, schools and shops were closed until further notice. And I read uh, articles that suddenly began to think out loud about the allocation of scarce resources to those most deserving. And within two weeks, I was reading um, newspaper articles that openly discussed whether or not people with Down syndrome or cerebral palsy should be left to die. 
of COVID-19. Um, excuse me, my voice is a bit nervous. I do not know why. So just forgive me while I continue. Um, with the appearance of COVID-19, as a person with a disability, my life had suddenly taken on more significance, or should I say insignificance. Finding myself to be expendable is to say the least alarming. And for the first time in my life, I was graphically experiencing what I had been teaching about in disability studies classes for years, the tentative nature of um, the positioning of people with disabilities. Medical professionals began to float the idea as to whether medical care should be rationed and who would be worth saving. In the two years since this article was written, I've often wondered how we were progressing. It's the first time, when I wrote this article for the first time, it was the first time I'd ever written for my life. And I have been um, nervous, my voice aside, ever since, because I don't think our position is changing that much in the past two years. And I feel the need over and over again to write for my life. So I'm pleased we're all writing together and um, moving in gradually from the edges. So thank you for the opportunity to speak to you tonight. Thank you. Sorry. Thank you, Nancy. Um, our next presenter is Baden Geek Franz. And she, her piece is called, You Don't Have to Have Neurotypical Sex on Autism, Sexuality, and Neurodiversity. Baden? Hello, everybody. Uh, so as Diane mentioned, my name is Baden, and I am autistic. I like to start talks this way because it gets everybody on the same page right away. I am autistic. I am not a person with autism in the same way that I am a Canadian person and not a person with Canadianness, a person having been labeled as holding a Canadian passport, differently American. Um, <laughs> I'm autistic, that is who I am, and that is the term that I use for myself. So a few years ago, I had a conversation with a friend regarding fears that autism would hurt my ability to have meaningful romantic or sexual relationships in my future. And this friend gave me some amazing advice that changed the way that I think about sexuality. She said, you don't have to have neurotypical sex. In the months that followed, I set about figuring out what autistic sex might look like. So I took a class with Dr. Michelle Owen at the University of Winnipeg called Disability, Sexuality and Rights. I hoped it might uh, help me to imagine what a more open and autistic friendly view of sexuality might be. I hoped the university course offered through the Department of Women's and Gender Studies would be less biased than the general literature I had found, mainly aimed at parents teaching their autistic children, mostly assuming autistic children meant seven-year-old boys, what sex is. I found this class very informative about certain issues, mobility, disability, and pain specifically, but there was almost no information that applied to my experiences as an autistic person. And I realized that if I wanted to know about what autism and sexuality were, I would have to write about it myself. And so that is the purpose of my article, filling this gap in the literature where autism and sexuality meet. My journey to learn more about autistic sexuality has been a fascinating one. I've read articles and fan fiction and blog posts. I've had conversations with other autistic people. I've considered my own experiences. And what I found over and over was that while as I had feared, there are some barriers and difficulties to autistic people when it comes to relationships and sexuality. There are also great joys. And importantly, those pains and joys often come from the very same places. The same communication differences that can make flirting difficult can also facilitate open and honest communication between partners. The low empathy that some people assume will make an autistic partner cold or unfeeling can actually make it easier to support somebody in need without taking on too much pain for ourselves. 
Sensory sensitivities that can be overwhelming at times can also lead to creative ways of incorporating different senses into sexuality. And again and again, the very places that I looked for pain were the places that I found deep wells of joy. So what does it mean to have autistic sex? I think this is a question that needs to be asked more. When autistic people feel that they must have relationships in a normative way defined by a neurotypical society, when we force ourselves to have neurotypical sex, it can cause a lot of pain and fear. But properly accommodated, autism can be just as much a positive influence on a relationship as a negative one. The autistic experience, just as the experience of any other neurotype, has both joy and sorrow in it. And all we have to do is find the joy. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Baden. And our last but not least presenter is Debbie Patterson. And she has written a piece called Extraordinary Bodies in an Ordinary World. Debbie? Thanks, Diane. Um, I just want to offer a, first a, a visual description in case anyone is vision impaired. I'm a white woman in my mid 50s. I have shaggy, long brown hair, blue eyes, and I'm wearing a sheer white blouse with black uh, scribbly circles all over it. Um, my piece is called Extraordinary Bodies in an Ordinary World. It's about um, being a theater artist with a disability. To paraphrase, and this is just like excerpts from it or a, a edited version of my piece. To paraphrase Malvolio in Shakespeare's Twelfth Night, some are born disabled, some achieve disability, and some have disability thrust upon them. I would characterize my disability as an achievement, a slow and constant progression that continually challenges me to redefine myself, my work, and my place in the world of professional theater. And while achieving disability isn't something I would have sought out, I know the challenge of constantly adapting to a new normal has been a remarkable teacher. A few years after I was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis, I started to limp. Nothing too severe, but enough that it was noticeable. And because of that little limp, I thought I had to give up working. I'd been a self-employed actor all my life. I'm one of the founders of Shakespeare in the Ruins. But even though my limp didn't really slow me down, just being noticeable was all it had to be to completely thwart my work as a performer. Everything on stage tells a story. And if something on stage doesn't serve the story, it's a distraction to it and it has to go. My limp was a distraction and that meant I had to go. Most people don't realize how incredibly physically fit actors are, uh, how they need to be in order to do their jobs. Uh, even boys classes in theater school had us rolling around on the floor and being really physical. Um, and not only are actors physically and vocally in peak form, but they have to remain mentally agile, be well read, have a broad frame of reference, cultivate empathy even for people we despise, be brutally honest with ourselves, be open, trusting, and emotionally available and vulnerable. It's a huge amount of work to develop all these skills. And I thought I would have to throw all that work and experience away because of a stupid little limp. So I stopped performing, but I really missed it. And then after one day, I went to see Cirque du Soleil. And as I was watching the show, I realized that what made it compelling was the fear that someone was going to fall. Well, the way I walked by that point made people afraid that I was going to fall. I was Cirque du Soleil. So I realized that rather than working around my disability, I had to learn how to work with it to move towards it rather than away from it. I had to find a way to use my unique physicality as an asset. I could embrace that vulnerability, that risk taking involved in moving around in this transformed body. I had no idea how I was going to do this. Roles for characters with disability were and continue to be mostly played by actors without disabilities. So I had to make it up. So I played Richard III. Richard III is uh, usually understood to be a man whose twisted body is a reflection of his twisted soul, as if his disability is, is a reflection of some sort of internal evil. And while it's hard to make an argument that his actions are wise and benevolent, it's 
pretty exciting to approach his ruthlessness as a result of the treatment he's received in a society that doesn't value different types of bodies. So rather than staging a play about a relentlessly evil, horrible man, our production of Richard III and Shakespeare in the Ruins was a disability revenge play. <laughs> Richard is courageous, witty, charming, insightful, intelligent, but all anybody sees is his disability. Nothing he does can ever outweigh that one defining characteristic. And as a theater maker, I can relate. When other people see me roll into the rehearsal hall in a wheelchair, they make assumptions about my ability and my experience. I have to demonstrate that I'm not just there to tick a box on a diversity checklist, but I'm actually a legit artist with a set of well-honed skills that I use to explore complex ideas through a sophisticated aesthetic. And that ability is, is uh, that, uh, that, that task of exploring complex ideas through a sophisticated aesthetic is something people can do with any abilities. I totally get where Richard's coming from. This character was al is almost always played by able-bodied actors who may have a sense of what it means to be uh, uh, underestimated or excluded or rejected, but they don't know what it means to live in an extraordinary body in an ordinary world. I know directors are sometimes afraid of hiring actors with disabilities because they worry about the accommodations that might need to be made, but all actors have, have needs that need to be accommodated and in truth, I was not the most high maintenance actor in that production. <laughs> My disability has made me a really good uh, problem solver, really resourceful and adaptive. I think it's really important for artists with disabilities to be included in our theater practice, not only because it's fair and everybody should, should be accepted in, in all professions, but because our perspective needs to be represented. First, audience members who happen to have disabilities need to see themselves represented on stage. But secondly, people without disabilities also need to be able to see the world through the lived experience of disability in order to understand what it means to be human. We all have bodies and they will all betray us. How do we find meaning and purpose in that betrayal? How do we learn to live in all of our flawed bodies? How does our fear of physical diminishment affect our faith in ourselves, our capacity for resilience, our ability to commit to self-care? Disability disrupts the capitalist assumption that a person's worth is based on their ability to produce. Wouldn't we all be better off if we reckoned our own worth on, some, on something other than our productivity? Disability demands that we acknowledge and accept help when we need it. Wouldn't we all be better off if we acknowledged our interdependence, if we valued our vulnerabilities as much as we value our strengths? Wouldn't it be better if we could all stop pretending that individual achievement is even a thing, is even possible? Disability has given me an understanding of the human condition that I could never have arrived at without my disability. And being an artist means it gives me the means to explore and communicate that understanding with people who don't have that lived experience. My artistic practice allows me to find value, purpose, and meaning in, in my disability, and my disability deepens my artistic practice. And this is a story I'm happy to be telling. Thanks. Thank you, Debbie. So folks, as you can see, there is a lot of material in this book. These are only 10 authors. There are 40 in the book. Um, if you would like to buy uh, a copy, we have copies for sale at, in the left-hand corner, my left. Uh, they're $40 each. Um, we also have some pins. Uh, I made a pin of the artwork that, that I did for the cover, which is called Fibro Points. Uh, and it, it's available for sale as well, as well as some keychains and pills, uh, pins from the Arts Accessibility Network. Um, no, we don't have any pills available. <laughs> Damn. <laughs> um, for those folks who are online, uh, go to Inanna's website, inanna.ca and you can buy a copy there. They're also accessible copies for people who have print disabilities. 
And uh, those accessible copies, I believe, are twenty dollars, and the um, uh, the print version is uh, thirty nine ninety nine, I think. So I want to thank everyone for coming out, and I want to thank the Arts Accessibility Network, Manitoba, for their support of this event. I'm so grateful for your support. And I would also like to thank Janelle Shaw, our executive director, for all the work that she has put into this event. Fantastic. And um, I would like to end with another poem from the book, very short, but it kind of segues nicely from Debbie's discussions around disability. And this poem is called Dissing, disability, disagree, disparate, disquiet, dissonant, disguise. Thanks, folks, for coming. <laughs>